Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host, Nick Villato. Let's get into mailbag part two, Nick. Let's get into this right away with a question from Marcus Aurelius. Uh, the uh, I just know him from the Gladiator. He says, you guys talk a lot about QBs busting in the first round, and there are plenty of examples. How much of this do you attribute to coaching and the situation? I feel like if the right people surround with the, are surrounded with legitimate talent, it will work if the traits you guys covet are there. I trust our GM to scout the right one and put the head coach to groom him. And I think Joe Shane and Brian Dable need the chance to develop their guy at the quarterback position. Marcus Zerilius is this guy's name, but Marcus Aurelius, great Roman emperor. I agree. This is something we covered on Mailbag Part 1 as well. You find your guy, and if if you have a good coaching staff in place, they can maximize said guy. But if that guy doesn't have it, then I think that can also be a huge issue. So it's just part of the puzzle for me. It's part of the pie. Yeah, I think Nick nailed the issue I have here, and this is the point. And what I've mentioned a lot in the past, which is, unfortunately, there are handful two handfuls of human beings on planet earth who can play the quarterback position successfully and keep a pass game and rhythm consistently. And so it doesn't just like, that's the problem I have with the whole situation. It's like, yes, I trust these guys, but how do I know that they're going to have their opportunity to get the traits that they covet to actually make this work? Cause that's the first factor. And that's a big, big reason here why I wanted them to have this first or second pick, Nick, is I do think that those two guys up top have those traits, but they won't have that pick now, either of those picks. So now it's a question of, and this is why, you know, some people didn't want them to win the games. For all you are like, how could you not want the Giants to win these past two games? Well, it's like, maybe this is a reason. There's few guys on earth who have the traits that can actually do this thing. They had an opportunity, now they don't. And it's like, they don't get it this year. When are they going to get it? Now, they may not look at it like that. They may view Jaden Daniels as having those traits or Michael Penix or J.J. McCarthy or any of these players is having those traits that they believe. But if they don't have that opportunity or that option, then what? That's that. That's the problem. Then you have to start reaching. And when you reach, it's like maybe you won't end up developing this guy. But does that ultimately end up being your fault that this guy didn't develop? Or was it just a matter of circumstance because you never had the opportunity to get one of those guys? Shuro asks, this is just a theoretical question. If the Giants drafted Michael Penix or any other left-handed quarterback and made them the starter, would, should the Giants shift Andrew Thomas to right tackle, or would they not draft the lefty quarterback given Evan Neal struggles? They will have no problem drafting a lefty quarterback if they believe it's their guy and know the Giants should not shift Andrew Thomas to right tackle. Yeah, Nick nailed this one. I don't think we need any other further on that. Okay, Crypto Fariz says, if you're starting a team right now, who would you take? This is an interesting one, Nick. I love these hypotheticals. CJ Stroud or Caleb Williams? Jeez, just a hypothetical, right? CJ yeah. Stroud, I think I'm going to say right now. I'll probably... these two. This is a guaranteed hypothetical. Well, yeah. they might get Caleb Williams. They could trade up for him. Well, my, my point is, like, I don't know anything about Caleb Williams, the person. I don't really know anything about CJ Stroud, yeah. the person. Yeah. But I've seen C.J. Stroud have impressive success at the NFL level already. So I might go with Stroud just based off that. Yeah, I, I think for obviously what Nick says is important. The qualifications are clear here. We don't know these guys off the field at all. And, you know, we also don't know. Pro, we don't, there's a lot of factors we don't have here. But based on what I've seen, I would actually take Caleb Williams over over C.J. Stroud. I just if I was starting a franchise and I was a head coach, I would want those those Caleb traits. I mean, his arm talent to me. And I like C.J. Stroud's arm talent. It's part of the reason he's so successful right now. He throws a great ball. It's an effortless throw. But see, Caleb Williams, man, I mean, that's just like life-changing type arm talent. And if you're a coach or if you're a GM, in my mind, you get a guy like that and you think all about all the possible ways you can scheme up your offense to divide, you know, explosive plays and touchdowns down the field and things that can alter games for your franchise's history. So I just think there's so much upside. And there is upside with Stroud, too. A lot of it. Stroud can easily be viewed by us in next year as one of the five best in the NFL. But I think Caleb can also be easily viewed as early as year one potentially i don't think that's going to happen he would need a perfect situation and i don't know if he's going to get that from chicago but where i think he's going to end up being but you know there's that opportunity at least and i, I just love the kids arm talent so it, it, not knowing what i don't know off the field I, I would still say caleb that's an interesting one though d money asks if the giants are drafting anywhere four to six do you think they would take Jaden daniels that high it's early in the process but i don't yes. see why not similar yeah, to the I, 
Anthony Richardson conversation from last year when people were like, oh, Anthony Richardson might go in the second round. It's like, that's no, that's not going to happen. He's going to be a top five pick. He has yes. way too much talent. Jane Daniels, I don't know if he'll be a top 10 pick. I'm imagining it will certainly be in the conversation, but there's still a lot to play out. Yeah, the answer to this D-Money is it depends on their evaluation of Jane Daniels. They believe he can be a franchise-altering quarterback. They will, because I will say this. I am confident in one thing. I'm confident that this current regime, Joe Shane and Brian Dable, will not be taking a prospect like Daniel Jones, to be completely honest with you. they At least not at six or five or whatever the pick they have. I don't think they'll ever do a pick like the like Gettleman regime did in the sense of like, was Jones' ceiling ever really top five from a trade-based standpoint? I would argue no. A lot of people who had a second round grade on him would agree with that. And I think just physical traits wise, it's a definite no with Jones. Not that he doesn't have, he has all the physical tools to be competent, but it would have to also, you know, combine a massive mental edge that he clearly doesn't have from a processing standpoint. So I, I'm confident this new regime won't be using an early first round pick on somebody that's, you know, more in that range. But I also think that, you know, we could see them take a Jaden Daniels that high if they believe Jaden Daniels has elite tools that could eventually be molded into a top five NFL quarterback. Steven Del Pome, please tell me if I pronounced that correctly. Slide into the DMs there, Steve. What is your feeling about the future of the head coach, Brian Dable, if more than one coordinator gets fired in the offseason? Yeah, that's a great question, too, because if more than one uh, gets fired or they mutually agree to part ways, the same thing in the end. It's the same difference. Uh, we'll probably be seeing more nepotism based hires. I would imagine moving forward, Nick, and maybe Dorsey joins the staff. Maybe uh, Leslie Frazier joins the staff. My feeling on the future of the head coach won't really change much off of that though. Like for me, it all is going to come down to can Brian day will get the right quarterback option in this offense. And can he develop him fast? And if those two things happen, everything else in my opinion will work itself around itself. Now, of course, if the Giants continue to get this unlucky on the offensive line and it's as disastrous as it was for the first six weeks of this season or whatever, yeah, it's not going to work out with the quarterback. We get your point that you can't have a quarter, but like, why am I banking on that? Andrew Thomas is probably not going to get as unlucky with injuries next year. John Michael Schmitz is probably going to be consistent and not injured and not a bet, you know, a better player next year. They're going to be able to add other pieces at, at, on the offensive line too. Why would I operate under the assumption that the offensive line is going to be as historically bad as it was in some ways this season in future seasons? I'm not going to operate under that assumption. Instead, I'm going to operate on the assumption of they can get it to average at some point soon, league average. I feel like what they had last year by the numbers wasn't league average, Nick, but I feel like the offensive line was perfectly fine last year. I think the Buffalo Bills are a great example of a team with Josh Allen over the years that hasn't really been top 10, top 15 ever in those quote unquote grades, which I think are bullshit anyway, because you're giving out like zeros and then they go into the cumulative grades. Like he's a 67.5 and the total grade is 71.3. It's like there was a zero grade in week eight, a zero. Like, what does that even mean? The scale is so screwed up at that point. So I don't really go by offensive line grades, quote unquote, Nick, but I think it was passable last year for the most part, the giants offensive line and the bills have had similar and they've been able to have success because of the quarterback. So I think if they can get to that point, um, yeah, I would I, I would say that that would be my, my number one thing for Brian Dable. Can he get a quarterback piece and can he develop it fast? 100% agree. It is all contingent on the development of the future quarterback of the New York football Giants. Who is the best day three pick for the Giants in the last 25 years? There have been plenty of really good day three picks. He lists. No, no, this was that? my list. This is my research. There have not been plenty. Oh, that was the was best. There's only three. Steven. That we could even consider here. No, that's not way. true. Jabril Wilson's not on this list. No, I didn't put there, Jabril there solid or Tony Jones, but like these are solid picks, but that, they aren't, I don't think they're all solid picks, but they're only three in their own tier. I should say this tier. I don't think Jabril Wilson could, could have a case for. Would you think he did? I mean, he was a key cog in, in winning the Super Bowl. But I wouldn't put him in were like this tier. The Giants for years, these three. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't put him in this. I mean, you got like David Tyree who could be considered. Yeah. There's a, there's a, I think there's more than what you're, you're giving credit to, but there was there a long more drought. Not in this tier. There was a long drought for a while, but yeah, this yeah. tier is an elite tier. I'll give you that. So out of this, Dan Schneier, my Bradshaw, 2007, round seven, David Deal, round five, 2003, Brandon Jacobs, round four, 2005, elite tier. I'm going to say David Deal though, as an I offensive tackle. Deal somebody who could play guard, somebody who can kick to the right side, the left side was a very solid player for the New York Giants. And I think wildly underrated at the same time. So I'm going to go with deal. Although Bradshaw and Jacobs, you're never going to hear me say anything bad about those two. Cause I absolutely love them growing up. 
Yeah, it's deal for me too. Obviously, I've made the case of how important the offensive line is, especially in relation to the running back position and the run game in general and the health of a run game. I'll also say this, you know, all of these guys, Nick, in that elite tier are 2007 or earlier, 2007, 2005, 2003, scouring through. You don't see a lot of day three massive hits for the Giants since 2007 from 2008 to 2023. He said last 25 years, but if you only go the last 15 years, you're struggling to find anything that you can talk about. I mean, you may have to even start to say, you know, players like Micah McFadden after one season, if you're looking at the last 15 years, that's how bad the Giants have drafted on day three in the last. Who is, who is the best in the last 15 years or since 2010? Who's the best? Matt Dodge? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was looking at it. I mean, I don't have it in front of me right now, but that, that list, but it's not good, Nick. Like I don't it's, know. It's got to be old day three pick that we could talk about uh, like a Julian. It has to be like Julian love and Darius, Darius Slayton, probably Darius Slayton. Like that's not, that's not real. That's, that's fan fiction. That's, that's what we think because they're on our teams, but you know, every team has a Julian love and, and Darius Slayton, in my opinion, at least uh, or most teams do. So it's been bad. This is part of why there's been such a drought and winning. Um, you know, it's been really bad it. recently. Yeah. Yeah. It's been bad recently. So, but yeah, I'd give it the deal. Okay, Kevin asked, serious question. Very few teams allocate as many resources to the offensive line as the Giants do. Yet, despite allocating those resources, we can't seem to fix it. Are we scouting poorly? Are we coaching poorly? Is it both? I think it's probably a Great combination question. of both. I'm going to go more so, and again, I hate to opine on this because I am not in the coaching world, but when you have this regime, this front office that I believe and I trust in their evaluation process. And they have a lot of young guys and none of those young guys have progressed. I think you have to start looking at the coaching. And I think that's, it's fair to point your finger at that when every single one of the players that were drafted in the prior regime and in this regime have not taken really much of a step forward in development. You got to look at the coaching. So I'm going to lean towards coaching, but also scouting in the past from a front office perspective, I think there were dubious contracts given out out of desperation to Patrick Omame and to Nate Solder that also affected the New York Giants ability to be effective on the football field. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great question, Kevin. We wish we knew the answer. I would say another factor in this is continuity. The Giants just simply haven't been able to ha to keep continuity on the offensive line. You look at this past two games. One of the big reasons the Giants have been able to look better is because there's actually continuity finally on the offensive line. They're playing a few games together. It's like for the first time this season, the Giants have the most, the biggest offense, or I don't know how to say this, the most offensive line combinations of any team in football this year. They've used the most different, you know, combinations. That's not a good thing. You don't want to do that. Continuity is a massive factor in the offensive line. Literally every offensive line we ever have talked to or have heard on other podcasts has said that. So like the lack of continuity over the years, I think plays a big role, but I think scouting plays a much big, uh, plays a, plays a much bigger role maybe as well too. Like, Eric Flowers, horrific scouting right there. Just a terrible job. He was big. He looked the part, but you could see on his tape at Miami that this guy was a very big risk, in my opinion, going that fellow. Will Hernandez, I know he's playing better with the Cardinals, but I don't think he's playing that well. And I just feel like he was boxing, like just like with the Giants, at least. Now, I got that wrong too. I thought he was going to be great, but like, you know, you miss on a 34th overall pick. It's not good scouting, in my opinion. I know he's been okay with the Cardinals, but like, there's other examples over time. I think continuity, scouting, coaching, all of these are factors, unfortunately. He also asks, would you rather have a New York Dirty Water Sabret Dog or a Rutz Hut Deep Fried Ripper? Have you had a Rutz Hut Ripper? I Next haven't time. had either of those. Uh, they both oh. sound disgusting. So, oh. Do you know what a Ripper is? No, I have no idea. Rutz Hut, amazing place that you should go to. Um, they created something called a Ripper, which is a deep fried hot dog that it's called a ripper because it's deep fried until it rips at the seam and then splits in between. It's fucking amazing. That's it's the good? only way to, eat, it's the best way to eat a hot dog. Is I it think. breaded? No, 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 not breaded. No, really? So it's just a cooked hot dog and, and boiling in oil. Anything in the deep fryer just tastes good and it's horrific for you, but it tastes good. Uh, <laughs> In my opinion. So just how it goes. Dirty water hot dog. I actually think you're right, Nick. I don't think I've ever had a dirty water dog from New York. I just, it's never appealed to me really. Um, like if I, I now I have, that's not to say I don't, I, I'm some, uh, you know, I don't eat from carts. I ate when I lived in New York, I ate from plenty of carts. I just loved halal food. I would crush a lot. Halal food is amazing, dude. So good. So good. Um, so one guilty, one guilty pleasure of mine, because I'm also not above eating from the carts. I just think those two options are disgusting. I love the, and this is probably disgusting as well, but I love the peanuts. That's oh, you go industry. for those nuts out of the cart. I oh, mean, I man. haven't in about a decade, but I used to go to the city when I was like 16, so 17. Good. 
They smell so good. And I've heard bad things about the way they're made. But when I was 16, 17, that Nick Filato crushed that stuff. Oh, God, I don't even want to know what those bad things are. All right. Moose Goose asks, after seeing the struggles of Bryce Young, do you think NFL teams will start shying away from short quarterbacks? Moose Goose, we talked about this on the last podcast. Not as much just short quarterbacks, but all but frail quarterbacks, thin yeah. quarterbacks. I think they will. I think Bryce Young has both of those, whereas Kyler Murray doesn't. And I think it's going to be a lot of general managers are going to see this Bryce Young situation and as clean as a prospect as he was outside of, of his height and his weight. And they're going to start having a lot of questions and it's going to suck for those smaller quarterbacks. Yeah, I think Nick nailed it. It's going to be about that frame. And I think we've seen the NFL go in cycles and adjust to what other teams are doing. Like we've seen like, okay, this 2017, 2018 era, Patrick Mahomes comes out of seemingly nowhere in 2017, 2018, Josh Allen. Now NFL is looking at it like, holy crap. When we have these kind of guys with these, uh, these kind of prospects with this kind of arm talent, legit, like, game changing game altering elite arm talent well guess what we're going to start to prioritize that in drafts and believe that our coaches can build and mold, mold out oh they have some issues on tape footwork mechanics upper body lower body we'll fix that our coach will get in and fix that same thing can happen you know with this trait the one being slender build short well we just saw it fail with bryce young looked like it should work he made all these plays at alabama he won them a lot of games he never really had wide receiver talent at alabama comparatively to what they've had over the years and he still made it work but then it just didn't work at the nfl level so yes i think it will giants comparable nick asked if you could only re-sign one long term for a middle tier contract who would you guys prefer cordell flott or isaiah simmons so let's just assume that they're both free agents at the same time because they're not because isaiah simmons is only here for this year sure. cordell flott has another two years under contract I'm going to go with Cordell Flott because I think Cordell Flott, the upside and what you hope after spending a third round pick on him is he can be a starting cornerback in this league. I'm I'm suspect with Isaiah Simmons being a starting linebacker. I think Isaiah Simmons role is very important, especially if the Giants were good this year. We would be hearing his name a lot more when they could pin their ears back and rush the passer instead of defending the run in the fourth quarter when the Giants are down, which is the sad reality of their situation. But I still will go with Cordell Flott because I think he at least has the upside to be a starting cornerback in this league. I would completely agree with you on flot. Okay. Tom Gorbacero Corbacero asks, is this team actually as bad as our record and play suggests? Well, Brian Dable would say so, right? You're only as good as your record. Look, so I think there's, I think you don't have the solution at quarterback. So if you're a four win team without that true long-term solution at quarterback, then yeah, maybe you are as bad, but I do think there are building blocks and players on this roster that would suggest that the team can quickly figure it out if they can solve the, the solution at the quarterback position and also some of the issues they have on the offensive line. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I think no, to answer your question, the team is not as bad as the rest of record suggests it's, been a massive injury year, especially along the offensive line. Like I said, most combinations yeah. on the offensive line of any football team, that's to me played the biggest role in how bad the record is. Okay. Where's beef ask what players do you think are in the best position to make huge leaps for the giants for fantasy football next year? Oh, we got a fantasy football question, Dan. Wanda Robinson is the first one that comes to my mind, but Jalen Hyatt, I think is the primary guy. Those are the two. W Wando Robinson, Jalen Hyatt, and then a post sleeper type buy appeal on Darren Waller because it's going to fall to like yeah. round eight or nine last next year. And I just feel like at that price point, I like it a lot. So those are my three, I would say. Um, but if I had to pick one, I would say it would be Wando Robinson. Okay. Scott Wollinus asks, do you think arm talent applies to arm wrestlers or just quarterbacks? How about baseball players? Do soccer players have foot talent? Soccer players absolutely have foot talent. You ever hear bend it like Beckham? <laughs> so yeah, what do you think about this? We well, should ask uh, Tyson Bajan's father. He's an arm wrestler, right? That's true. So Scott Willness is a friend of mine. Uh, Bob, as he's referred to in the group that I, I know him from, he gets on me. He craps on me because he hates that my use arm talent. He thinks it's a stupid term. And I use it because it is. I, I took, tried to explain this to you, Scotty, but I use this because. A lot of people conflate arm talent with arm strength, or they conflate what I'm trying to, I shouldn't say arm talent. You don't like arm talent. They conflate what I'm trying to describe from a quarterback with arm strength. So if I just use the word arm strength, Scott, it wouldn't get a point to uh, get across the point I'm trying to make, which is, you know, do you have the ability to change the trajectory on the football, to change your arm slot, to, 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 to throw with touch, to throw with pinpoint ball placement that maximizes yards after the catch. That's what I consider arm talent. Arm strength doesn't really, touch on any of that stuff so maybe if that's not the term that you like 
You could come up with one, Bob. Give me a term that will work better <laughs> to describe what I just described. How about that? Be constructive uh, with your criticism in that, in that regard. All right, let's get to the next one. Rich R asks, what's Nick's favorite topping on a Little Caesars pizza? Um, and can you rate your the Giants offseason signings from worst to first? Favorite toppings? Look, man, you can't go wrong with the sausage. And look, Little Caesars are getting more ad time here. Go to Little Caesars. Check out Little Caesars. Little Caesars is awesome. Get pepperoni. You can get sausage and peppers. You can get onion. You, they have a lot of options there. But if I had to pick my favorite, probably would be the sausage. What about you? I want to direct this question to you so we could talk longer about our sponsor, Little Caesars. Yeah, I would say it's bacon. Bacon is, to me, one of the most mm. underrated toppings on a pizza. I get a lot of bacon pies. That are the curly, smaller curl-up pepperonis. Uh What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. There are few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. Order online during our Pizza Pizza pregame, one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs, plus all day on Sunday. And get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that. Put it on half the pie, the entire pie. There are so many other options that I don't have time to name. Slap that on a round crust, a thin crust, a stuffed crust, a Detroit style deep dish. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. Dan, it is gift giving season and there is no better gift to give your loved ones, your friends, than an experience, a concert, a comedy show. You like Broadway? Check out a Broadway show. Go see a live sporting event. Maybe go check out the New York football giants if you want to. And the best place to get tickets for any of these events is game time. Snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code BANTER. That's B A N T E R for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code BANTER, B A N T E R, for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, ranking these is going to be hard. Let's just talk about these, some of these one by one. Uh, decision to re-sign Saquon Barkley one year, 11 million. Would you say good or bad? We'll just go good. like that. Good. good. Decision to re-sign Daniel Jones four years, 160 million. Good or bad? I'm, if I have to choose one, I'm going to say bad at this point. And that's yeah. flies in the face of, of what we said prior. To this we were wrong. Like you could be wrong in this business. You're going to be wrong a lot. So I would say bad there too. Darius Slayton, two years, 12 million. I would say good. Definitely good. Okay. Jihad Ward, one year, 1.5 million. I'll just say, meh. 
I, I'm going to look, I don't think it's good, but I, I understand it and I'm not opposed to it. And if the Giants didn't have Jihad Ward to edge, and this says a lot about the current New York Giants right now, then who else is playing that position? At least he is functional, which is the current state of the edge, which is terrible. Okay. Jamie Gillen, two years, four million. I'm actually going to say good on that one. Yeah, good as well. Uh, Nacho, three years, 12 million. Solid. Yeah, solid. Man. I think like yeah. I think we got to have like this, you know? It shouldn't always just be like this. I think this is good and it's solid. Jihad Ward would fall into that as well. And I go man on both of those. Bobby Okereke, that's obviously good. Yes. Paris Campbell, not so good. No, not so good. Don't even know uh, whose fault that is. If it's always Paris Campbell, it, I think it's a lot I, of things, but no, it didn't work out, but it's low cost. Yes. Agreed. Uh, Ashawn Robinson, one year, 5 million. He's been playing a lot better than, than I expected. So I'm going to go with good at this point. Million, I believe. Yeah. He's, I thought he's it was eight. Yeah. Yeah. It says five here. It must've been eight. This must've not been, I'm going to go with eh on that. He's been good lately, but wasn't good at the beginning of the year. Um, obviously didn't have as much of an opportunity or a role. Bobby McCain. No. Yeah. No, that has not worked out. Guy hardly dresses. That's no good. Um, all right. I don't think I missed any other major ones there. So obviously not a massive off season from the giants there, despite resigning some of their own, obviously Dexter Lawrence would be great if we were doing that one as well. All right. Let's get to this question from Henry White, who says, do the giants take advantage of the international development spot on their practice squad? Jordan Mayalata is the success story for the Eagles. Yeah, we attempted it with, uh, what was it? Yep. Big Roy was his name. The guy, from, uh, the guy, the guy that was a Mura, Roy something. Yeah, from Nigeria, we, we yep. attempted, and he, he had some traits and everything, but it, that's a big jump. And a lot of these guys yeah. haven't played football at any organized level against people who are even co somewhat comparable to being college football players, let alone NFL football players. So it's difficult, but I hope they continue to to look at that. It, wasn't Sandro Platzgummer also a member of yes, that as well? He was from Germany. Mm -hmm. Yep, correct. All right, Moose Goose asks, "Give me your assessment on our rookie cornerbacks, Trey Hawkins and Deontay Banks." I think Deontay Banks is better than advertised at this point. I still think he he's losing one-on-ones in the red zone, which is resulting in touchdowns, which brings down his PFF grade and things of that nature. But I think he is a lot smarter than, than we expected as a zone cornerback, very sticky in man coverage. I have appreciated a lot of what I've seen from Deontay Banks, and I remain very high on him. Hawkins, I still think there's inconsistencies at the line of scrimmage with his footwork. I think in one-on-one -on -one situations in man coverage, he's susceptible to being burnt. He's susceptible to double moves. He's not as confident as Deontay Banks, but he's a six-round rookie. This is what I expect from a six-round rookie. So I'm not going to say, yeah, he's done, he's toast. But I just say the expectations that we probably unfairly put on him after training camp, we can throw those out the window now. Yeah, I think Nick nailed this on both of those players. Um, I haven't loved what I've seen from Hawkins on tape. I just feel like he... All those things you just said, Nick, like, I'm not so sure how correctable those things are long term. They may just be traits based issues. That is part of the reason why I fell to the sixth round in this draft. Banks, on the other hand, I have been very impressed with. He's actually more. I saw a stat this week, Nick, where Banks is like top three in the NFL in amount of times he's had to cover a number one receiver, been tasked with covering a number one receiver, which means you know he's had really one of the most difficult tasks of all corners in the NFL this year, veterans and rookies included. So definitely thrilled on, on the Banks front. The one Hawkins. thing I'll, yeah. yeah one, oh, sorry for cutting you off. No, I, go ahead. I'm excited to see him against AJ Brown. Like no one's looking forward to the game against the Eagles. Who wants to see us get our asses kicked again by this team who unfortunately have owned the New York Giants in recent memory? And that is so devastating for me to admit, but you just got to be objective. Them and the Dallas Cowboys have owned the New York Giants. We want that to turn around. So we're trying to get this roster to a point where it can turn around. I want to see Banks against AJ Brown. AJ Brown is clearly one of the best big physical guy. I want to see Banks against him. So that's probably the number one thing I'm going to be looking forward to when the Eagles actually play the Giants. Yeah, I like that. All right. Lenny De La Cruz asks, name a couple upsides this season. Kayvon Thibodeau is the number one guy. Kayvon Thibodeau, I think Dexter Lawrence is still an upside to this season. People are like, oh, his stats are down. I'm like, are you kidding me? You watch the film? This guy is absolutely dominating everybody. So Deontay Banks, definitely an upside to the season. It's the development of the young players. He's, yeah, I would add Wandale Robinson. We didn't know what to expect from him coming back off an ACL. It's almost like he's no worse for the wear. Some people take a full year to get back to their form after an ACL. Wandale Robinson looks like he got it right back. That's a huge positive development for me. And then Jalen Hyatt, like I said, it's not that I didn't believe in him. It's that I didn't really see a lot of these traits displayed on film at Tennessee. And a lot of those traits are now being displayed at the NFL level in year one as a rookie. It's a really good sign. So those, to me, are two of the biggest positives in addition to what Nick named. All right. Horse racing community asks fantasy football giants question. Is Darren Waller worth a speculative ad for my fantasy playoffs? Any Intel? No, we do not have Intel. 
I think if you have a roster spot, especially since he is still on the IR, and if you have an IR spot, pick him up, plug him into your IR, and wait and see is what I would say. Because who knows? I thought a month ago, no way. He's just going to sit it out. But now the Giants look like they're actually competing and there's some excitement. I wouldn't be shocked if he came back. So I think he's worth a spec at. Well, he told Wal- Darren Waller, we're recording this on Wednesday. Darren Waller told reporters, or maybe it was just Dan Duggan, I'm not exactly sure, that his plan is to play next week against the Saints. That is the target date for him to return. I would say he's worth a speculative ad. I have a li- I had more excitement for him with Tyrod Taylor. I felt like they were developing a really nice rapport from a target volume standpoint. DeVito is an unknown from that standpoint, so let's we'll see how that works. But either way, I mean, they've developed a lot of this offense and designed it around working it through Dar- Darren Waller injuries have prevented that obviously, but it's still in their, you know, arsenal and something they might bring back out. Okay. New York giants, Matt asks, who do you want the giants to draft? Assuming both Caleb and Drake may are either gone by the time the giants pick the teams that, or the teams that are, are in position to draft them are not willing to trade those picks. And he says, and what number will Jaden Daniels wear? Yeah, he'll have an issue wearing number five with cave on Thibodeau on this roster. So it'd probably be Jaden Daniels, but again, I am so early on in this process. So I just want to make that clear, but there's a lot of intrigue there, but I have no yeah. idea what number this kid would wear. Yeah. I don't know who I want the giants to draft right now. It's too early for me to say who I definitely want the giants to draft. And I don't even know what pick the giants will have. Um, so a lot more time will go into that. I did really want Drake may though on this roster. I'll be honest. I just felt, I had this weird feeling with may. I just, I love everything about what's going on with him. The fact that he played, went to that, sh- that crappy ACC school that doesn't really have much talent in my personal opinion, like the worst evens I've ever seen. And then just has moments that are just so big time to me over these years. I, I felt it. And I believed the first time I watched him play last year and I texted Nick right after, but for a little while there, I thought the Giants were going to get him, especially with Joe Shane going to like four of his games. But at this point, they've won, I think they've won too many games to have an opportunity to get Drake May. So we'll see what happens there uh, outside of those two quarterbacks. Uncle Jesse asks, do you guys see Jerome Henderson being hired as defensive coordinator? Should Wink leave this offseason? And should the Giants decide to promote from within? I think you can certainly look at promoting from within. I don't know who is most qualified. Look, Jerome Henderson, basically his entire career has been a defensive backs coach. I think he was a passing game coordinator, according to his Wikipedia with the Atlanta Falcons, but he hasn't been a DC yet. So there might be more qualified people on the roster or outside the building. I, for one, am certain about one thing. I want Jerome Henderson to be on this roster. So if he can accept that as a defensive backs coach, certainly. I think it would just be a huge step to be the DC. But if he can earn that and he understands the acumen of everything else that has to do with the defense, then yes, I'm I'm open to it. Yeah, it would just depend entirely for me on does he have familiarity at all or comfortability, comfortability at all at calling plays? Because I feel like it's a little bit more risky if you just throw them into the mix um, without that. Um, and we're going to skip this next one, Nick, as an exact decision from somebody who – uh, I believe was trolling one of us on Twitter and uh, we, we can leave this up, but I don't want to answer this guy's question. He's an asshole. Which one is it? It's the guy who would you, you quote tweeted today. Oh, for, Oh no, I love this. Oh, this is in response to me saying we're having a mailbag giants. One, one, two, one great follow. Everybody it says for what man, take a break, get a new hobby. No punctuations. Obviously and this says the person who follows me for my giants content. Wow, Nick Filato going into his bag, pulling a little Dan Schneier out there, getting back in the nitty gritty and in the dirty with these with these trolls. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to respond to this guy. I think he's he's been muted for me for a long time and just attacking you today. Get it? Tells you to take a break. That that you're reading him there. He says, "For what, man? Why are you guys doing a mail, mailbag? Take a break and get a new hobby." My response to this guy would be you get a new hobby, right? Like you get a new hobby. That doesn't mean you go to other people's pages and trash talk them. Do we do that to you? No, we don't do that because we're more well-adjusted to society. You need to start becoming a person who doesn't just go on people's pages to negative back talk them. And I don't want to get too far into this, Nick, because this is your battle to fight, but I, I, that guy will never be, (laughs) will never get on this show again. All right. Peter Moeller asks if Brian Dable uh, oh, sorry. I, I missed a question from Zach here, Nick, that I want to get to. Zach asked, after this disastrous season, have you guys lost any confidence in Joe Shane and Brian Dable moving forward? So confidence, have I lost confidence? I, I guess so, just because the confidence was so high. But I like to think of it more as the honeymoon phase. I think they just knocked the honeymoon phase out of the park. It was an absolute grand slam. And now we have regressed a little bit, which puts things more into a re- realistic perspective. So I think that's probably my way to term it. 
I'll say I've lost a little bit of confidence in Brian Dable as an in-game coach. And I think that's fair to say. Mm. I feel like his in-game decisions that's a good point, not, buddy. have not been so great this year. So I have lost some confidence there. I've lost no confidence in what made me so excited about him to begin with, which is that I believe he can develop a quarterback and get us to a point where we have a really good quarterback situation. So I've lost no confidence there. Joe Shane, no, not for me, though. I understand why you might. Um, I just feel like he's been dealt an unlucky hand with these injuries on the offensive line. And at quarterback, I just don't know how much of that was John Mara based, like the decision. Like, because you could say, like, should you lose? Like, you know, a lot of people ask me this, Nick. They say, like, okay, Dan and Nick, I love your analysis you guys have done. You've taught me a lot based on the film. And what you've taught me is that, you know, defenses have adjusted to what they saw of Daniel Jones on tape in 2022. They've taken it away and he hasn't been able to, you know, process fast enough to adjust after that and to come up with a different solution. And they say, is that Joe Shane's fault for not? thinking that that could happen. And I think that the answer could be yes in a vacuum, but overall, I'm not so sure how much of it is pressure based and outside factor based. Like I don't really feel like Joe Shane, Joe Shane could have franchised tag Jones. He could have done that, but then he would have lost the opportunity. I think to get Barkley at a price they felt comfortable with. So it don't really know how much of an option that was. And I know they weren't going to be able to let him go. John Mara was simply not going to let Joe Shane said, I want to do something bold here. And I want to just say, I don't really believe in J J Jones's long-term future as a Super Bowl type contending quarterback. I, I just, I want to bite, bite the bandaid off now. Yes, it might mean we have a season of Tyrod and DeVito at quarterback. But as we start to see now, Nick, like, is that really impacting the Giants' chances to win that great to have Tyrod to go from Daniel to Tyrod or Daniel to DeVito? At least based on the team that's compiled this year and composed this year, the answer is no. We see it right now, right? Daniel Jones won how many games with the Giants this year? Daniel Jones had a two touchdown to six interception ratio with the Giants this year. He was bad in performance and he was bad in winning football games. DeVito's won two games in a row. You know, Taylor won one game and should have won a second game if not for his own mental error. And that was against the Bills. So like, if you look at it like that, there is a little bit more, I think, just not blame, but just concern or curiosity involving Joe Shane. Because in my opinion now, the drop off from Jones to to Taylor, like this is the season. Like, I don't, I guess some people aren't, I haven't noticed it, but like, what are you watching then? Because it doesn't feel like Daniel Jones was playing that much better in 2022, even than what the Giants are getting from quarterback right now. And I know he won them games. He had a lot of good scrambles, kept drives alive with the scramble. But like, was it that much better than what they're getting this year at quarterback? Uh, I, don't, I don't know for sure. It was better. It was definitely better. Was it that much better? 40 million, $47 million better long-term, you know, 80, 90 million guaranteed after the restructures that they did to push back cap hits to 2025. I don't know if it was that much. And so then, you know, maybe there's some concern. I just feel like so much of it was fan pressure and merit based though. Real quick. Want to get Dan in my opinion on this other than quarterback, or maybe not. What positions do you believe the Giants should address with their first three draft picks in the 2024 draft? I'll just preface it by saying, look, value. We haven't studied these guys. It comes down mm -hmm. to that. Yes. But if I just had to do this, you know, not considering perfect those world. things. Perfect world. Edge. I think cornerback. Offensive line. Right? Edge, corner, offensive line. In that order, I would go corner, offensive line, edge. But yes, okay. those are the three big ones. You're right. I don't know if I agree with that. Like, to me, I'm just kind of throwing them all out there because I think they're all needs. I think edge is a bigger need than than maybe we're talking edge about. Edge is a bigger team. need than corner, but I think corner has very valuable. Uh, is what? It's very valuable. To is No, I just think to this specific defense, assuming Wink will be there, that it just will give them a better chance to, to take the jump. Okay. Peter Muller asks, if Dable and the Giants part ways with Kafka, Johnson, Wink Martindale, or Thomas McGahey, who do you think would be some of the better options to fill those positions given the Giants scheme and current 2024 roster? So that's a kind of a deep dive. I don't know if I have any coaches in mind to 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 uh, insert here. I would say I think they would probably promote Shea Tierney, the quarterback's coach, to be the offensive coordinator under Brian Dable. Brian Dable would still control a lot. Special teams, I have no idea. Bobby Johnson, look, we've thrown a lot of names out here. Some of those guys are on teams. Just pull up a Brinks truck and try to get 
Mike Munchak or any of these offensive line gurus who have proven development track records in the past, who have taken bad offensive lines and have maximized the talent. That's who I'm looking for. But I don't have a name off the top of my head right now. And then defensive coordinator, I don't want Wink Martindale to go anywhere, bro, to be honest with you. But um, I think Leslie Frazier is somebody they're going to consider, but I don't think his scheme is conducive for the current yeah. personnel. So there's a whole conversation there as well. But again, it's still early. Yeah, too early for me to get into uh, to coaches right now. We'll go Clay from Brooklyn who says, why are position coaches dropping like flies around the NFL? But we are still stuck with our O-line and our special teams coaches. How much worse could anyone be at their jobs than what we are producing now from both of those units? Um, why would we wait until all the good ones are already hired? Yeah, I think it's a good question. From a special teams perspective, I think the Giants love Thomas McGahee. I think the organization, John Mayer, they all love him. I think the coaching staff loves him. I just think the product hasn't been too refined on the football field. And the Giants should probably look to turn the page. I hate to say that, but I mean, proof is in the pudding, right? It has not been a good special teams unit this season. It wasn't really that great of a special teams unit last year either. And then the offensive line, I think Dable is loyal to Bobby Johnson. They know each other. They work together over there in Buffalo. But now at this point, with the lack of development, as we've already said on this podcast, I think you need to start looking in another direction as well. So maybe it just comes down to loyalty, which is somewhat ironic because John Mara and the Giants have not been loyal to coaching staffs in recent memory. Yeah, I think that Nick nailed that one as well. I think it's a it's a combination of loyalty. It's also a combination of just coaching hubris as well and like working with your friends type of thing that's still, you know, even on this staff, we're still seeing, you know, you see that and, around the NFL. It's not just and excuses you know, too, but like legitimate yeah. excuses, right? Like the Giants did have a lot of continuity issues on the offensive line because injuries. they were plagued by injuries and you lost your left tackle and you didn't have a contingency plan. And this is some of the issues that Joe Shane had, all the contingency plans that he had, they were volatile and they all kind of blew up on him. And that's not the best spot for Bobby Johnson. But if you just look individually at each player, the giants added, have any of those guys taken significant steps forward? No. And I think that's where it's like, do you start to go in another direction? Yep. Rowan asked random question from someone who has never attended a giants game in person, but wants to, if you could give me a high level thought on minimum costs, logistics, some must do's must don'ts. I know it's an atypical request. Do you, uh, do you have anything on this, Nick? I know I've been to a lot more game, uh, a lot of Giants games. I'm not sure. If you yeah, I haven't, I haven't been to many Giant games. Uh, I went to one this year, but that was in Arizona, so it's a little bit different. So Dan mm -hmm. is probably much more tailored for you. Yeah, I used to go to a bunch of Giants games. So some some thoughts are, I don't do this because I'm not smart enough to, but a lot of people I know are smart and they'll bring in bottled water. You just have to make sure that the cap isn't open yet. They'll also bring in, you can bring in a plastic bag full of food. So if you want to bring in your own good sandwich from a place, do that too. Not only are you going to save money in both regards, you're going to get better product, like not with the water. You can get water there for like nine bucks or whatever, but, <laughs> but the, but the sandwiches there are just like horrible. Like nothing is good. Like at least not in the upper tier where I sit, like everything is just like, Oh, here's a sausage and peppers. This isn't that great crappy tip typical tenders chicken tenders bucket like just crap food for the most part for one like couple period season of my life they like experimented with gourmet food and made it more of like a city field type feel where you can get amazing food at city field and then they just like regressed the giants and like went back to like crap stadium food so i would i don't do it because i just typically don't eat at games but I'm just too into the game and, and nervous. This is like goes back to when the games mattered more. Like obviously the Giants have a lot of meaningless games recently, but but when the games matter more, I was too nervous to eat for for the most part. So, but you can bring in food. I would say if you're going to a cold weather game, Rohan, some tips I have are to always double sock, always wear two pairs of socks, never do one pair, and then always bring. This is a trick that my dad's dad taught him. Uh, bring a cardboard cut, cut out of a cardboard box with you and. So when you're sitting, you actually sit your, you, you sit your, you rest your feet on the cardboard box rather than the cold pavement. It makes a massive difference in your, in your, in staying warm. So those are just a couple, a couple small tips. You there. insulate your feet from the concrete. That right. That's interesting. Yeah. I yeah. thought you were going to put it and you were going to sit on it because the seat no. is really cold. Yeah. I, I mean, you could do some of the seat too, but usually you have enough layers there, but yeah, the, the, the cardboard box on the concrete is a, is a nice trick from, uh, interesting. Al Schneier. Um, my dad's father. So red chair QB asks, Hey guys, I love the pod and YouTube film breakdowns. I've seen Michael Penix mock to the giants at the top of round two, keeping his play aside. Do you have concerns with prospects health uh, and with being a left-handed quarterback uh, with the giants having, you know, Evan Neal protecting his blind side? 
Thank you so much for the kind words. Red chair quarterback. I have more concerns about Penix's health than the right tackle situation. Albeit, I think that is something we have to consider, especially for a rookie quarterback. Now, Penix has a really good feel in the pocket. I don't know if that necessarily is going to translate to the NFL level. I want to say he doesn't like take a lot of sacks. Like he has a very low sack rate. I would need to pull the numbers up. I don't have them in front of me right now, but I still think having Evan Neal as your right side protector is somewhat of an issue. But again, it's not something that would prevent me from taking him if I believed he was the guy, but the injuries is definitely something that is going to be a red flag on his evaluation. Yeah, I think Nick nailed that. I haven't seen that much Michael Penix yet, um, but from what I've seen, I do f- <laughs> I don't want to say I feel this with any kind of confidence because I'd like to watch a lot of tape before I have any kind of confidence. And that goes for any player ever at any point. But from what I've seen, I do get vibes of college type quarterback out of Michael Penix. Um, I don't love the drive he has on his throws. I don't think he has much drive. I think a lot of these throws are college level throws that won't work at the NFL level. Um, And I don't love the fact that like he has some mobility, but it's not amazing. Uh, he, he drifts sometimes in the pocket. I don't know. I just watch him and I almost feel like it's a college quarter, like type, type skill set. but that's only off of like two or three broadcast angle games. Right. So it's like, let's, let's get the chance to actually take the time in February in January and March to watch these guys. And Nick and I will do that. Then we'll get you some better evals on these types of players. Um, Nash B asked if we don't end up being a position for the top two QBs or Marvin Harrison, what position are you most interested in drafting, assuming we're in the top 10? So I know, Nick, before you answer this, I know you're you're, you're with me. We don't like to draft for position. But let's say perfect world, yeah. or five different prospects, exact same grade, but different positions. What would you be your oh. ideal position? So we already kind of touched on this a little bit before. I think edge is in the conversation. Edge might be number one for me, but I, I want to find that alpha number one. And if it's like a Marvin Harrison or the kid from LSU, both those guys from what I've seen have definitely intrigued me. But I don't want to rule out cornerback either. So, but if I had to pick one right now, I want to find that edge that's going to complement uh, Kayvon Thibodeau and then allow his user Jalari to be a situational pass rusher where I think he would thrive. Ideal world for me would be if there's a sauce type to get another corner in here and then have banks oh, yeah. in that corner just locking down and like seeing what Wink Martin Dell can do schematically if he had those two types of guys on his outside. Okay, Alex Buston asks, I'm trying to think of a question that doesn't come off often. So when you're watching the all 22 film on offense, what improvements have you seen from Daniel Bellinger? Are there things in the film that you haven't seen that have improved from year one to year two? I would say he's just stronger at the point of attack, maybe a little yep. bit better. Um, just more physical as a blocker, but he was physical as a rookie as well. So I don't want to undervalue what he already put on film during his rookie season. Sure. I think we've seen him in a much more dialed back role because the Giants had Darren Waller and they're not really, like I said on the last podcast, running plays prescribed to him, even when they are in the red zone, a lot of the plays aren't, he's the first read. So I think he has taken a lesser role, but from an evaluation standpoint, I think he has jumped a little bit as a blocker, but Again, was pretty damn good last year, too. Yeah, I think for me, Nick nailed it. But I would also say, and I also think this is another example of something where he was good at last year, too. But I think he has his spatial awareness in as a route runner, especially on the vertical and hard, and uh, intermediate plane, if you want to call him that. I know you guys love the plane talk, but in the intermediate and vertical areas of the field, we can say he just I feel like he has a much better feel for for where to be. Um, and I'm not saying it's a much better though, because I think it was good last year. The ball just didn't come his way a lot. Um, that's not really on him in my personal opinion. Um, and not just my opinion in the opinion of anyone who knows what they're talking about in that regard. So just think he's done some things that, you know, we've already seen him do, but he's just, you know, further advanced that he can do them. Okay. Jesse Chimino asks, Giuseppe Chimino asks, do you guys see a path to the last wild card spot for the giants? What would such a path look like with our remaining schedule and with some of the other teams battling for that spot? I I mean, if if that's possible, they have to win on Monday night because they'd be battling with the Packers who are currently in the final wild card spot. But no, I don't really see a path. You would have to defeat the Eagles. And I no, I just don't see it. Um, the path would start with so there's there's two spots, right? There's five teams that are locked in, Cowboys and up. Uh, there's two spots here. It would start with beating the Packers. They, this would be a must win type of game. Uh, the Packers would then drop to seven losses. The Giants would stay at eight losses and they would have the tiebreaker over the Packers. It would also require the Giants ending up with a better record by one game, at least in the Seahawks, who would own the tiebreaker over the Giants there. Um, so you have to factor that in, though the Seahawks would get the six seed potentially. Uh, then you have that seven seed open. The Vikings, the Packers in the mix there. 
uh, probably still those NFC South teams, but also the Rams. The Rams are playing good football right now. They beat a yeah. tough Browns defense up. So that would so it would basically require beating the Packers and the Rams, the both of those two games, and then having a few more things break their way. <laughs> Nikki Vocab and Rant Daddy Dan. This is from All Things Giants. Thank you. Nice. At Giants Things. In the spirit of the gift giving season, who would be on your free agent wish list next year to add to this team? You can only pick two. Yeah, I haven't done free agency stuff yet. I apologize for this, but I'm just going to go ideal positions would be interior. A guard would be perfect for me if we could lock in just a beautiful beast guard that like no chance of missing like the next uh, who's the guy that the Chiefs signed a couple years ago from the Patriots. That dude has been amazing. Um, why am I blanking Joe Tooney. Name? Joe Tooney. If there's like a Joe Tooney in this class, that would be my ideal. And I don't even need I, you said I could only pick two. Give me one. If I can get a Joe Tooney, that's all I want. Yeah, when Joe Tooney hits the market, it's freaking excellent, right? And then that's who you spend up on. Similar with Brendan Sheriff. And I'm on the same boat. I'm I have not done free agent work. So I'm gonna say guard. And then if I had to pick another, look, let's go with edge. Yeah. But what great edges are hitting free agency? No, none. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, Horace Horace shit, who I think is Horace shit, who is named Mark Martinez. He's a uh, nice little play, a little fun there. He's having on horse shit. Uh, he says, do y'all want the Giants to target a running back in the draft free agency? This is a big one for me, Horace. I am very anti spending money on free agency in the draft. I always want running back at running back. I always want running back to come via the draft. I'm right there with you. Jason Metz from at word of Metz says with five games left, what are the top three to five things you need to see out of players positions that would define your plan for reshaping the roster in 2024? I'll start. Evan Neal is the first person that comes to my yes. mind with this. What the hell is he going to offer you moving forward? Will he develop? And I don't even know if we get that answer. Evan Neal, one, two would be, can you get any kind of consistency from Aziz or Jolari? If not, is there going to be another injury? If there is another injury, we need to make that more dire to fix that. Number three would be any development at a Cordell Flot. Can we feel like where we're at a corner moving forward, we can move on from a Dory, but also not feel dead by that. So those would be the top three for me. Okay, Battlestar Tarant Tarantula asks, what can the Giants do schematically to limit deep passing plays by the Packers? You'd play top down, play a lot of deep zones. Yeah, right. Like cover three quarters, palms, things of that nature. More so, though, like cover three. And then you just force the check down, rally and tackle similar to a Patrick Graham type of approach. But that's probably not what the Giants are going to do. They're going to run man coverage. And that's going to give Jordan Love opportunity to attack on one on one down the vertical plane and also horizontally, which could be successful. But at the same time, the Giants could find a way to shut that down now that Christian Watson more than likely isn't going to play. Although I'll say this. Jaden Reed, Romeo Dobbs, I think they're two very underrated wide yes. receivers. Especially Jaden Reed. You turned me on to him. I remember in, during the pre-draft process, I wasn't thrilled with him from a profile standpoint and just from like my thoughts on watching Michigan State. And then I actually went, and you liked him, I remember. And then, or not, you didn't love him, but you liked his tape. And I went back and I actually watched more tape. And I was like, yeah, I get it now. He's just one of those dudes. Like, he's not at the level of a McLaurin, but he's one of those McLaurin type dudes that just isn't going to flash traits wise or like testing wise. But like, See, I think he's even film. a of that though like my oh, thing was he was trapped on a michigan state offense so you just didn't yeah. see it a lot you know michigan state was so bad to watch from a quarterback so standpoint last year yeah i mean that's what happened with nico remember we taught we love nico yeah, we Collins in that pre-draft process and we we always said like this could be a situation where that michigan quarterback play was so bad and that offense system was so run heavy bad that nico collins could just be so much better at the nfl level and he ended up being that. He's obviously having an insanely good season with CJ Shot up there. All right, last question. Roger Hoodell asks, the Giants can't draft Drake May or Caleb Williams. What should they do at quarterback? And why is the correct answer to Jameis Winston? No. Jameis, man. I, I would sign up for it just for the the, 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 the discussion. Oh, the discussion. He's, he's a fun guy. He's a unique, fun dude who is very turnover prone. But at the same time, he's the type of quarterback that will drop back to pass throw the football and you say, no, what are you doing? And then somehow it gets completed and it goes for a touchdown. You're like, ah, that's Jameis Winston. He's a very fun guy to watch, but uh, I don't know if he's the answer. I think it would be um, some sort of either rookie in the second to third round. If the yeah. Giants don't say, if they, they don't decide not to go in the first round. And then maybe if they don't do that, a veteran, I don't know if it'd be Jameis. I don't know if they'd spend that much, but it's interesting because they did on Tyrod Taylor, which makes you think a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah, they did on Tyrod Taylor, and Joe Sheen said, look at our quarterback situation. We're going to have to do something there. Um, so something will happen. It's just a matter of what's the best option. I, I'll come back to you. I'll look at the free agency and see if there's anything intriguing there. Jameis is not so intriguing to me. I like. There's parts of Jameis I like, his, his aggressiveness, but there's parts I don't like. I feel like every time he gets in the game, they're just like throwing picks, the Saints, and it's just – I just think that that ship is set. Like I honestly, like, I know he's been injured a lot, and so I'm not going to say his name. But I like Tyrod Taylor. I just think he's been injured a lot, and that does take him back. And like, but I think if Tyrod ever stayed healthy for 16 games in this system, he'd actually look a lot better than people realize with Andrew Thomas if he could stay healthy too with him. But that's not the answer. Obviously, he's been injured, and the Giants, I think, are going to move on from that. So. Yeah, that's the dilemma that every team has. If they don't have an opportunity and they don't have access to those real, true, top tier talent quarterbacks in a draft class, it can sometimes be dire. You sometimes may have no options that are actually feasible toward getting to your goal, which is, by the way, the reason why, just to give you guys insight onto the into this, why some fans don't want to win these games and aren't happy when they beat the grind out a 10-7 win against the Patriots. So you may think they're crazy, and I understand that, and the objective is to win the game, but the objective is to win games long-term too, and that's how those people are, are thinking of it. They're thinking of it like, oh my God, the Giants had a chance at a the second overall pick. This is the one time they're going to have a chance at that type of top tier quarterback talent. We don't know if every class is going to even have that kind of top tier over quarterback talent. I really wanted that to, to seize that opportunity. And now that opportunity is gone due to the win. So just to give you their perspective on why they feel that way, I know a lot of you are understanding of this already, but maybe for those who, who, who can't comprehend, uh, you know, why some people might not want to win these games. Um, I don't mean that as like, I don't mean that in a, as a slight at all. I understand that some people are only focused on the objective is to win these games. And I get that because Look, you don't want to see losses for your team ever. But um, that's all we have for today on the Big Blue Banter Mailbag Part 2. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great rest of your week, and we will talk to you soon.